Congratulations! You finally made that big decision to lose weight and get healthier and stronger. You're sticking to your diet and workout routine till one fateful night. The dreaded hunger pang strike, leaving you wide awake, hangry and questioning everything. Should I be this hungry on a diet? Is this normal or is there a better way to handle this? Hungry and angry? You hangry, Claire. Hello, my dears, and welcome. I'm Marina, a registered dietitian, here to support every weight loss warrior out there. I walk the path myself, and let me tell you, I've met the hungry me, and she wasn't that nice. But today, I will nicely answer your questions about hunger and weight loss, and share crucial tips on how to manage that hunger better to achieve your weight loss goals. Understanding why hunger occurs and identifying the type of hunger you are experiencing is crucial for effective management. There are two primary types of hunger, homeostatic or physiological hunger and hedonic or psychological hunger. Physiological or homeostatic hunger is purely physiological sensation, a feeling of discomfort or weakness caused by the lack of food. It signals the body's need for energy and nutrients driving us to eat. This type of hunger occurs because our bodies strive for energy homeostasis, a balance between energy intake and expenditure. A few hours after our last meal, our stomach becomes empty and blood sugar levels drops. In response, the stomach produces the hormone ghrelin, which sends a message to the brain that it's time to eat. The brain then increases our appetite and we seek food. The higher the levels of ghrelin, the hungrier we feel. This type of hunger can generally be relieved with any type of food because its primary purpose is to restore energy levels. I am so hungry I could eat a skunk's bottom. For instance, picture yourself in a survival challenge deep in the heart of jungle. After hours of wandering, you stumble upon a bizarre looking fruit. It may not be your usual snack of choice, but in the jungle, it's all about survival, right? Survival. This scenario illustrates how homeostatic hunger can be satisfied with any available food to replenish energy levels. However, the quality and type of food consumed can still impact how effectively and sustainably hunger is satisfied, a topic we'll explore in more detail. But despite being simpler to manage, this type of hunger is strongly influenced by another type of hunger. Merciless. Insatiable. Psychological or hedonic hunger. Hedonic hunger describes the consumption of food purely for pleasure or fun rather than to maintain energy balance. Hedonic hunger is driven by the sensory pleasure of eating. This type of hunger is often triggered by the sight, smell, or taste of food, even when we are not physically hungry. Consumption of food just for pleasure became widespread in the Western world due to availability of highly palatable food. A typical example would be eating a piece of delicious cake after a big meal. You are not really hungry anymore and you don't need energy, but the cake is in front of you, looks amazing, tastes even better, and you cannot turn down your grandma. Oh, Hercules, Hercules, Hercules! This illustrates two key aspects of hedonic hunger. Eating when not in a state of energy depletion and consuming food uniquely because of its rewarding taste, independent of its caloric content. Also, our eating behaviors evolved during our childhood through direct experiences with food and by observing the eating behaviors of others, primarily home and cultural environment. As kids, we might learn that we need to finish our plates although we are not hungry anymore or that if we were good kids, we will get ice cream. Examples as these generate certain emotional experience that can be related to eating patterns in adulthood which may override the body's natural hunger signals. How about you guys? Did your grandma ever tell you to finish your plate? 
In this context, we must mention a subset of hedonic hunger, emotional hunger, which occurs when individuals eat in response to emotion such as stress, boredom, sadness or happiness rather than to satisfy physiological hunger. It is characterized by the desire to seek comfort or distraction from emotional discomfort through food consumption. It usually involves excessive consumption of hyperpalatable energy-dense foods rich in sugars and fats, mostly in response to negative emotions, but also may be associated with positive emotions. In cases of hedonic hunger, we can't speak about actual biological hunger, but rather of appetite and cravings. Appetite is simply the desire to eat, while cravings refer to desire to eat a specific food. For instance, you might crave a piece of chocolate after seeing an advertisement or feel the urge to snack while watching a movie despite having a big dinner minutes before. This is because the brain's reward centers are activated by palatable foods, releasing chemicals like dopamine that create feelings of pleasure and satisfaction. It has been shown that in obese people, hedonic hunger is more prominent. What about you guys? Do you feel like snacking in the evening or do you crave specific type of food? To distinguish between two types of hunger, we have some cues that can help you. Physiological hunger gradually arises. This type of hunger allows for a variety of food options and it does not typically fixate on one specific food item, especially not in the middle of the night. We feel satisfied and stop eating when we feel full and we usually do not experience guilt afterward. In contrast, psychological hunger manifests suddenly in response to sensory cues such as aroma or appearance of appetizing food or in response to emotional states. This type of hunger often feels urgent, leading to eating past the point of feeling full and not eating mindfully. It may also be accompanied by feelings of guilt afterward. Now, all this doesn't mean we can never eat purely for pleasure on a weight loss diet as both types of hunger can lead to overeating if not managed appropriately. Calories, 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 calories. But recognizing these distinctions empower us to enjoy food for pleasure on our terms when we decide and not in response to stress or other stimuli. Understandably, we will have to reduce the quantity and frequency of consuming higher energy-dense foods to achieve weight loss, but they can still be a part of our diet. <laughs> Fooled ya! Come on, let's go drink till we can't feel feelings anymore. Let's explore how hunger changes during a weight loss diet and what strategies can help manage both types effectively. He's hungry! What could happen? When we reduce calorie intake to lose weight, we create a calorie deficit, disrupting the energy balance our bodies strive to maintain. This deficit prompts our bodies to turn to store body fat for energy, facilitating weight loss. However, our bodies are naturally reluctant to tap into these fat reserves, which historically were crucial for survival during times of famine or food scarcity. Our physiology is still wired to protect these reserves, triggering several biological mechanisms designed to maintain energy balance. In other words, our bodies aren't as enthusiastic about our weight loss goals as we are because they operate on ancient survival mechanisms that evolved when food was scarce. Are you mad, woman? This mismatch leads to increased feelings of hunger during weight loss as our bodies elevate hunger signals in an effort to conserve energy stores. This phenomena is driven by hormones and the two key hormones that play pivotal roles in regulating food intake and body weight are ghrelin and leptin. Ghrelin, often called the hunger hormone, is produced in the stomach and released when our stomach is empty. It enters the bloodstream and travels to the hypothalamus in the brain where it signals hunger. Throughout the day, ghrelin levels fluctuate, typically peaking before meals and declining after eating, which affects our appetite. 
but sadly, a meta-analysis investigating brain activation and appetite perception in individuals with obesity found that they are more sensitive to hunger and less sensitive to satiety and feeling full compared to individuals with normal weights. So there's the first blow. That blows. And here comes the second. During a weight loss diet and calorie deficit, ghrelin levels start to increase within a day or two, continuing to rise over weeks. The longer we maintain a calorie deficit and the more fat we lose, the higher our ghrelin levels become. Higher ghrelin levels, bigger appetite and more intense feeling of hunger. Unfortunately, it has also been shown that these changes in hormone levels and appetite and hunger levels can persist for a year after weight loss or even more, making it harder to maintain weight loss. Oh, more bad news! Ultimately, ghrelin acts as a biological mechanism that defends against further fat loss, aiming to maintain the body's energy reserves, which are crucial for survival. That's why we sometimes call ghrelin the bad hormone when it comes to weight loss, as it literally sabotages our efforts. But we should be forgiving because ghrelin doesn't know there's a McDonald's around the corner and that we won't face extinction and we have less fat on our bodies. And as all the villains have a hero to fight them, let's not forget about leptin. Leptin is the opposing hormone to ghrelin and often called satiety hormone. It is produced in our fat cells and its role is long-term energy regulation, meaning it also regulates body weight. Leptin is some kind of messenger for our fat cells. Fat cells use it to communicate to brain how much fat our body carries. When our body carries extra fat, leptin sends signals to our brain that we have enough stored energy reserves and decreases our appetite so we don't overeat. By that definition, obesity wouldn't be possible, right? That would be nice. Die, calories, die! But unfortunately, research shows that in obese people, levels of leptin are normally very high in theoretically more than sufficient to suppress appetite and accelerate metabolism. However, obesity has been associated with leptin resistant and with central leptin deficiency. This means that although there is enough leptin going around, the brain is less sensitive to or fails to recognize the signaling process. When we are in a caloric deficit and losing weight, leptin levels drop and increase brain activity in areas involved in emotional, cognitive and sensory control of food intake, making us hungrier. So, I guess leptin isn't the hero after all, more like a ghrelin sidekick in the weight loss versus hunger battle. Just like Batman and Robin. So yes, in a calorie deficit, ghrelin will make us hungrier and leptin doesn't help either. So what do we do? But next, we will explore all the nutrition strategies to manage that hunger caused by those hormones better. But before, let's answer this question how much hungrier we will be during weight loss. So far, we established that calorie restriction increases hunger. Even if you follow all the strategies we will mention, you will still experience some level of hunger. For some, it will be physiological, for some, psychological, and for some, both. The sensation and perception of hunger is individual, influenced by genetic and personal factors. Some people tolerate hunger better than others, while some struggle to recognize their appetite sensation. Additionally, some obese individuals fall under so-called low satiety phenotype, reporting a weak satiety from a well-balanced meal or even increased hunger after eating. Oh, why am I so hungry? There's your third blow. For some, increased hunger will not be as prominent at the beginning of the process as ghrelin levels are not that high yet, but for others it will be an immediate difference. This is understandable since people with weight problem are used to eating larger portion and overeating at times. So the smaller portion sizes will be a distinct difference. 
Due to different cultural and environmental eating behaviors, hunger cues are not always clear for everyone. I can speak from my experience and that of my clients. Back in the day, I couldn't tell if I was physically hungry, bored, or just feeling an emotional trigger to eat. So when people say to listen to your body in relation to weight loss, I am not always listening. My brain often tells me to eat chocolate all the time, and my brain is part of my body. <laughs> the brain is so stupid. What do you think, guys? Is this a good advice? The level of hunger you will experience is hard to describe, but there is a spectrum. Using a hunger scale can help you identify your hunger levels and respond appropriately. It's important to assess whether the hunger is physiological or tolerable and to consider when you ate your last meal, how you're feeling, etc. You can use a hunger satiety scale to get in touch with your hunger and satiety cues, but it takes practice. Eat something when you reach level 3 or 4 on the scale. Don't wait too long to eat your meal because when you get ravenously hungry, you are less likely to make smart choices and have a greater chance of overeating. When you reach level 6 or 7, you should be satisfied probably within 15 to 30 minutes of eating. Take your time to eat your meal and try to accept this feeling. Satisfied and not hungry, but not overly full. I know it will be hard because this feeling is new on a weight loss diet and might feel weird and uncomfortable, but with time, you'll get used to it. Of course, don't think that being hungry all the time means you're losing weight. Well, you are, but this could be a dangerous mentality. Being hungry, satisfied, or stuffed are different states that can be learned through exploring and working on your mindfulness where you really sit down to eat your meals without distraction and plan your meals ahead. Additional mindful techniques can also help. Eat slowly, chew your food thoroughly, and savor each bite to give your brain more time to receive signals that you're full, helping prevent overeating. Stay hydrated because sometimes thirst is confused with hunger. Practice mindful breathing before eating to become more aware of your hunger and satiety cubes. You can also keep a food diary to track what you eat, how much and how you feel before and after eating to identify patterns and triggers for non-hungry eating. If you find yourself eating out of boredom or emotion, distract yourself by engaging in different activity like going for a walk, reading a book, cleaning, or practicing a hobby. Now for the nutrition part. Creating a calorie deficit is essential for weight loss, but the size of the deficit significantly impacts how manageable hunger will be. Appetite and food cravings can intensify with drastic calorie restriction, leading to intense hunger, fatigue, and nutritional deficiency that are difficult to sustain over time. Research suggests that a smaller, more moderate calorie deficit of 300 to 500 calories below your total daily energy expenditure is more sustainable and easier to manage in terms of hunger. This approach allows for gradual weight loss, providing time to adapt to necessary dietary and behavioral changes for long-term success. A smaller deficit also helps in maintaining muscle mass and reduces the likelihood of triggering extreme hunger signals and associated stress response, which can lead to overeating or abandoning your diet. Did that ever happen to you guys? Share in the comments. By reducing calorie intake gradually, the body can adapt more easily, mitigating the intense hunger pangs often associated with more aggressive calorie restrictions. Another crucial factor influencing hunger is protein intake. In most scenarios, protein proves more satiating than carbohydrates or fats. Even a modest increase in protein can enhance satiety and facilitate weight loss by reducing overall energy intake. This heightened satiety from protein has been observed both with single meals and across the day. 
Research also highlights that high-protein meals effectively reduce the hunger hormone ghrelin compared to high-fat meals. Additionally, protein stimulates dietary-induced thermogenesis more than other macronutrients, requiring more energy for digestion and met metabolism, which can boost metabolism and calorie burning throughout the day, aiding weight loss despite a smaller calorie deficit. Diets rich in protein, typically around 1.2 to 1.6 grams per kilogram per day, with 25 to 30 grams per meal, have shown improvements in appetite control and body weight management. Some studies even recommend intake levels as high as 2.5 grams per kilogram per day, especially for those engaged in physical activity. I generally advise clients to aim for at least 1.2 to 2 grams of protein per kilogram per day, constituting roughly 25 to 30% of their total daily calories. Therefore, increasing your protein intake and incorporating protein-rich foods into every meal is essential and helpful. Opt for lean protein sources like lean meats, fish, legumes, low-fat dairy products, soy products, and eggs. Where's that steak? Beyond protein, specific foods can play a significant role in curbing hunger. Certain foods are more satiating calorie for calorie, typically whole natural foods as established by studies like those conducted by Holt and colleagues. Their satiety index of common foods indicates that the most satiating per calorie include boiled potatoes, lean fish, oranges and apples, beef, oatmeal, whole grain pasta, and surprisingly, popcorn. Conversely, highly processed foods such as cakes, donuts, and candy bars tend to be less satiating. Their findings conclude that foods highest in satiety often contain substantial amounts of water, dietary fiber, and or are rich in protein. They also note that higher fat content in foods does not necessarily enhance satiety. Addition to protein-rich foods, dietary fiber plays a crucial role in hunger management. Dietary fiber can reduce hunger and prolong satiety, particularly soluble fiber, which slows gastric emptying and enhances perceived fullness. Foods rich in soluble fiber include beans, oats, barley, again apples and oranges, carrots and potatoes. Increasing your intake of fruits and vegetables not only helps achieve recommended fiber intake, but also supports another critical aspect of hunger management – volume eating. Volume eating emphasizes foods that are low in calories but high in volume, allowing you to eat more for fewer calories. Food! Food! Give me more food! These foods typically have higher water and fiber content, stretching your stomach and curbing hunger. Fruits such as berries, citrus fruits, apples, watermelons and melons, along with vegetables like leafy greens, broccoli, cauliflower, peppers, tomatoes and cucumbers are excellent choices. Soups and broths, due to their high water content and low calorie density, along with low-fat dairy products and whole grains, also contribute to volume eating strategies. Whole grains, particularly compared to refined grains, suppress appetite more effectively due to their fiber content, which slows digestion and helps maintain stable blood sugar levels, preventing spikes and crashes that can also trigger increased hunger. Hydration is equally essential. Adequate water intake helps prevent mistaking thirst for hunger. The European Food Safety Authority recommends adults consume approximately 2 to 2.5 liters of water per day. Some studies suggest drinking a glass or two of water before a meal can reduce energy intake, particularly among older adults. But the most effective intervention for weight loss considering liquids is replacement of caloric beverages with water or other non-caloric beverages. While liquids are important, solid foods have advantages for satiety. 
Compared to smoothies or blended foods, solid foods require more chewing and longer oral exposure time, promoting a greater satiety response. Eating slowly can also enhance satiety by allowing sufficient time for signals of fullness to reach the brain, reducing the risk of overeating. Studies indicate that slower eating leads to increased meal satisfaction and reduced post-meal hunger. Regarding meal frequency, optimal strategies vary among individuals. Research provides conflicting evidence on the effects of meal frequency on appetite. Some studies suggest that the number of meals does not significantly affect appetite, while others propose that either three or six meals daily may be better for managing appetite. Therefore, determining the optimal number of meals for you and your lifestyle may require some investigation and experimentation. Lastly, lifestyle factors such as exercise, sleep, and stress management significantly influence hunger, and appetite. Sleep duration is a critical regulator of body weight and metabolism, particularly affecting hormones. Sleep deprivation is linked to reduced leptin and elevated ghrelin levels, meaning inadequate sleep can increase hunger. One study observed that individuals sleeping less than 8 hours experience a proportional increase in BMI due to decreased sleep, with those sleeping 5 hours versus 8 hours showing a 15% reduction in leptin levels and a 15 increase in ghrelin levels. Therefore, sleep is crucial and very important. Let me sleep, please. What about you guys? When you experience sleepless night, do you feel more hungry? I certainly don't feel hungry. I feel hangry. Exercise also plays a vital role. It facilitates weight control partially through its effect on appetite regulation. Evidence suggests that acute, moderate to vigorous intensity exercise can suppress subjective feelings of appetite and hunger hormones. While exercise generally has a positive impact on appetite for most people, individual responses can vary widely. This variability means that the effects of exercise on hunger and food intake may differ from person to person. Nevertheless, given the numerous benefits of physical activity, incorporating enjoyable forms of movement into your daily routine remains a valuable and recommended practice because exercise also contributes to managing stress. Stress has long been recognized for its influence on eating behaviors in humans. Stress-induced insatiable hunger is considered a potential contributor to obesity and is likely rooted in psychological factors. Predicting whether stress will lead to undereating or overeating is challenging, but certain patterns can be observed. Acute stress typically results in decreased eating, whereas chronic stress tends to lead to increased eating. To effectively manage stress, evidence-based techniques such as mindfulness, meditation, regular physical activity, maintaining adequate sleep hygiene, and nurturing supportive relationships have shown promising results in reducing stress levels and promoting healthy eating behaviors. Yeah, stress is so stressful. In conclusion, managing hunger during weight loss involves understanding different hunger types and implementing effective strategies like balanced nutrition, mindful eating, adequate sleep, and regular exercise. By experimenting with what works best for you, sustainable weight loss is achievable, but remember, it's a journey unique to each person. Thank you for watching, my dear. Like, subscribe, and share if you found this video helpful. Let's support each other on our weight loss journey to better health and healthier life. See you next time. Bye.